Hi there, folks. David here from Michelson's Attorneys. Thanks very much for joining us for this Q&A panel discussion on data processing agreements. We've got a really uh, great set of panelists here today that I'll introduce you to. But first of all, let's just take a moment to acknowledge that we've got almost a thousand people attending this call today. So thanks very much for taking time out of your day to listen to us talk about data processing agreements. So just to go through our panelists today, we've got John, we've got Lisa, we've got Tracy, we've got Nathan, and then we've got Swakele managing the questions and helping us all out. So what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about data processing agreements, known as DPAs for short. Now, a DPA is a legally binding document that describes an arrangement between two organizations where one does information processing operations for the other. Um, now, the most common form of this is between a controller uh, and a processor. And the reason that it's important is that in terms of relevant data protection laws, the controller generally bears the lion's share of responsibility for complying, but they're obliged to enter into this written contract with the processor to put a number of obligations on them because they are ultimately responsible uh, for what the processor does. Um, we've got 60 minutes today. We're gonna to be sticking to a strict time limit. So you're gonna be hearing my timer in the background uh, ratcheting up like this as we go through our little five minute sessions just to keep everybody on track. Um, and there's lots and lots to talk about, but we really want to keep today interactive. With that in mind, we've got a number of polls that are going to be happening, and we know people have lots and lots of questions about Papier and other data protection laws. We're really grateful today if you could confine your questions to things about data processing agreements so we can really uh, focus on that topic. Um, we're going to hand over to John, and John's going to start off by explaining to us why data process agreements are important, and he's also going to run, run a number of polls uh, just to get the interactivity going. Over to you, John. Fantastic. Thanks very much, David. And um, yeah, let's run a few polls just to get a better idea of you as the audience. And the first question we thought we'd ask you is get a better idea of, of who you are and what role you perform. So if you wouldn't mind ticking there who you are just so that we've got an idea of the audience we're expecting quite a broad spectrum i think lots of people are interested in in dpas but it's always interesting to have a look so almost uh, half of you have voted i'll give you another um few seconds but um i'll share the results now but there are a lot of you are information officers which makes a lot of sense and many of you are also in legal and in compliance and uh, that makes a lot of sense but it's good to see that we have a few uh, heads of organization here. We also have a few members of governing bodies, but information officers, the winner, which is fantastic. And then the, the next question that we thought we'd ask is then to um, ask about the size of your organization. It's always relevant in talking about something to know what size you are. And uh, let's get a quick idea of whether you're small, medium or large. And I think, as you probably know, these uh, uh, bands of employee are important because often there are exemptions attached to number of employees. So let's end that poll there and, and share the results. You'll see if you're not quick off the mark, you're not going to get to participate in the poll. I'm going to be very quick. <laughs> but interestingly, most of you are small, which is interesting. And, um, uh, but there are many medium and many large as well. That's certainly going to have an impact on the discussion. Uh, in any discussion, it has a significant impact. And then the last question we wanted to ask is, which laws do you need to comply with? And that's also always very interesting. This is a multiple choice, so you can select more than one. So whichever law you need to comply with, um, please, please tick that and let's get an idea. This is particularly relevant in terms of DPAs because it impacts on terminology on approaches, on what the law requires you to do. Um, so it's a very important thing to, to look at. All right, thanks very much. We're almost, we've got a lot of people have voted. So let me share those results with you quickly. So Papier is by far the winner. So almost all of you have to comply with Papier, but 35% of you need to comply with the GDPR. So I'm assuming that that out of the, out of all of you, there are about 35% we need to comply with GDPR. Many UK, um, some African countries as well, and other countries around the world as well. All right, so if we go straight in then to, to really, I, I'm here to explain why DPAs are important. 
And I think the first reason is that the law requires you to have them. It's as simple as that. And if you don't have them, you could be fined by an authority around the world. And if you think that data protection law is principle-based, it's often difficult for an authority to say, hmm, have you um, specified your purpose for all your activities? And so in that scenario, it's often difficult for someone to pin you down. But the DPA requirement is, it's obvious, it's, 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 it's certain. You need an agreement between you and your processes or operators. And it's something that an authority can check and go, do you have it or don't you? Show me the agreement. It's, uh, it's one of those things that, that, that uh, a regulator could easily take action against you um, about. So that's the first reason. But I think, as you know, us at Michelson's, we, we really want to understand why. So why does the law require it? And really, the laws created this pyramid or, or hierarchy where the controller or responsible party must protect personal information, but we wouldn't be protecting it if they don't need to make sure that anyone who processes for them also protects it. So that's the reason that the, the law's done it that way. I think the, the second reason really for me is, like with any agreement, the purpose of it is to put a fence at the top of the cliff rather than an ambulance at the bottom. It's about two parties who are in a relationship, a data processing relationship, agreeing their rights and responsibilities with regards to the personal data. And if it's done correctly, it should smooth the relationship, improve the relationship, and also prevent personal information from being abused and, and uh, used to cause harm to people. And then I think finally, the, the, the reason why is that you want to create a contractual remedy between you and your processes, if you're the controller. And if you're the, the processor, you're wanting to limit your liability to the controller. I think a lot of processes find that they're frustrated that the controller wants them to do everything um, and almost assume the role of a controller, whereas they're just the processor. They're not getting paid to make sure that the controller complies with all aspects of the law. So there's really something in it for both of them. But for the controller particularly, if there's a drama, the regulator or the data subject is going to go after the controller and they have rights under law. If there isn't a contractual obligation down to the processor, the controller is going to be left with having to pay the fine, pay the damages without re the processor. So really, that's uh, three reasons for me why DPAs are important. And uh, back to you, David. Brilliant. Thanks very much, John. I'm just going to quickly um, share the results of this poll. And we also that Poppy was the most dominant one there. And just stop sharing that. And uh, great, take the poll off the screen. Brilliant, folks. Um, so now we're moving over to Nathan, who's going to give us a word on terminology when it comes to data processing agreements. Uh, over to you, Nathan. Thanks very much, David. So when it comes to terminology, there, there's much confusion and that's because different terminology is used across the world um, and, and DPAs, I know we refer to DPAs generally, and when we refer to it, we actually mean data processing agreements. But um, in other areas of law, you have a um, data protection authority, which is referred to as a DPA. You have a durable power of attorney and a defensive patent ag aggregation. So, but but just to just to um, to simplify it, when we're referring to it, so it's a data processing agreement, and uh, it's crucial not to confuse these terms because they each have uh, different legal meanings and consequences. Uh, and then just moving to to the DPA itself. A lot of people call DPAs different uh, things. Uh, so we've come across data processing addendum, schedule, annexure, and there, there are slight nuances between those, but we'll, we'll clarify them as we go along. Then we've heard of privacy agreement, personal information agreement, PAPIA agreement, GDPR agreement, and uh, well, also operator or processor or sub-operator, uh, sub-processor agreement. And the reason for these, um, for the, the the differences in terminology is because uh, there are pockets of data protection across the world and each industry has sort of developed or, or each jurisdiction has developed their own terminology. The approach we've taken at Michelson's though is that we've, we've taken a global approach to defining these terms because uh, I'm not sure if you're aware but generally across the world uh, they 
the standard terminology. South Africa's terminology under Papia is a very specific and unique, and I'll, I'll give you a few examples. So um, let me actually just share this in the chat with you. Uh, over there. So, for example, we refer to uh, personal information uh, under Papia, but internationally it's personal data. Then we refer to the responsible party or controller as a um, well, the response the controller as a responsible party, as well as the processor as an operator. And this generally tends to create confusion because there are uh, some companies actually operate across borders. Actually, many companies. But we've we've decided to take a global perspective to to uh, future proof uh, our clients uh, for our clients so that when they transfer data across borders where their contracts deal with, with their DPAs deal with entities across different jurisdictions that there's sort of a shared terminology so we generally refer to controller processor uh, and uh, personal data and then uh, the last point on that is with DPAs specifically. Uh, when there's a consistent terminology and we use the same language, it reduces the need or the, the creation of uh, confusion for, for, for different entities. And so we generally prefer for our clients to adopt that terminology. And if you, if you join our program, which deals with this in more detail, you'll see that uh, these uh, points are clarified and dealt with in more detail. Thank you very much, David. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Nathan. Would any of the other panelists like to add any thoughts on terminology? Go for it, John. So I think you're on mute there, John. Sorry, thanks, David. I think let's launch a quick poll here um, to get a feeling whether you think we should be using global terminology or South African terminology. I think while you're voting, uh, just to give you my a thought is that if you need to comply with multiple data protection laws, and we saw that about 40% of you do from that question earlier, the last thing you want to do is conclude one operator agreement with your processor for Papier, and then you have to sign another agreement for the GDPR, another one for Australia, another one for the United States. Clearly, you're going to have five agreements. That's just crazy. You want to sign one agreement with your processor and be done with it. And that's why I would argue that global terminology is much better because you, you've then solved the problem once and for all. You're not going to have to do it again. But it's interesting, not many of you agree with me. Um, <laughs> uh, well, well, maybe. Let's have a look at the results here. Um, not many of you are saying global terminology. Some are saying, well, most of you are saying South African terminology, which, which as I explained, I, I don't think is the way to go. But then, interestingly, almost as many of you are saying, global but connected and I think that's possibly the answer so what we could do is say it's define the parties as controller otherwise known as the responsible party in South Africa uh, so that you connect the two but still stick with the global perspective back to you David Brilliant. Thanks very much. And we're bang on time. Um, so moving on to the next topic, I'm just going to be addressing the question of who should the parties or the audience be to a data processing agreement. And to talk about this, we need to understand a few key terms when it comes to data protection laws. So the first one is the data subject. So that is the living human being or in certain jurisdictions like South Africa, for example, existing juristic person that the personal data is about. Now, this is the person that we're all focused on protecting when it comes to relevant data protection laws. They're typically not party to a data processing agreement, but ultimately the data processing agreement is designed to protect their personal information in terms of South African terminology or personal data in terms of global terminology. Then we need to talk about the controller, also known as the responsible party from a South African perspective. Now that is the person who decides why and how to process the personal data. And even in that definition, it's a little bit misleading because it's far more important that they determine why than exactly how. They can in fact outsource the entire how and still remain uh, the responsible party. Um, if you are confused at all about whether you are a controller, you could join our program and you'll find our module on the role players there has lots of tools to help you work that out. Then the second role player we need to understand is what's called the processor, also in South African terminology known as the operator. 
I always like to say that uh, why do these things have different names in South Africa? Well, as Trevor Noah says in his stand up, the world goes this way, South Africa goes that way. We went that way and we came up with our own names uh, for these roles. But the processor is the person who processes personal data on behalf of the controller without coming under their direct authority. So it's someone from a distinct organization. If you're an employee of the controller, you're not going to be uh, one of their processes. It's usually an independent person, like a supplier, like a service provider. Um, that's, that's how that works. Now, determining who you are is not as simple as uh, saying, you know, who pays money to whom, although a general rule of thumb, if you're paying someone for a service, often you will be um, the controller and they will be the processor. However, that's if there's nothing else fetching their discretion. So a common situation uh, in, in the business world is getting audited, for example. Generally, if you're paying an auditor to audit you, they are subject to various audit rules and things that actually make them the controller and not the responsible party. So it's not always as simple as that. Um, the fourth term we need to talk about is the sub-processor, also known in the South African context as the sub-operator. And this is someone who processes personal data on behalf of the processor or the original uh, operator. And this really goes to my phrase, which is that no organization is an island, we're all connected. So in the same way, the controller cannot provide their service on their own, nor can the processor, the processor often needs to subcontract things to a sub processor. So now that we know who's who in the zoo, we can talk about, well, who should your data processing agreement be between? And most commonly, it's going to be between your controller and your processor. That is a standard uh, situation for a data processing agreement. Um, but then it also goes down the chain. So you could also have one between a processor and a sub-processor, or indeed a sub-processor and a sub-sub-processor. At that point, I prefer to call them a downstream sub-processor because it gets a bit confusing when you get uh, to that level. Now, who should a data processing agreement not be between? Well, it should not be between two controllers. And we see this in terms of data, relevant data protection laws that there is, it's someone who decides how to process personal data alone or in conjunction with others. So you can have two controllers for the same activity or in South African context, uh, joint responsible parties. In that situation, you need a different sort of contract. It's typically called a co-responsibility agreement or a joint processing agreement or even a data sharing agreement. And it looks similar to a data processing agreement, but it's quite different. It focuses a lot more on divvying up responsibilities because the parties are jointly responsible. The place you definitely shouldn't have a data processing agreement is between a controller and the data subject. Uh, that relationship is usually governed by a privacy policy, privacy notice, some other sort of disclosure, and you certainly don't want to have any uh, policies between the processor and the data subject. Typically, you want to work through the relationship uh, with, the, with the controller. So I hope that gives everyone some insight when it comes to the parties of the audience to a data processing agreement. Would any of the other panelists like to add anything? Okay, it looks like I'll uh, go for it, John. Yeah, so again, I think let's just launch a quick poll here and let's ask you what role does your organization mostly play? And uh, it's mostly because, as I think you're probably aware, is you can play different roles in the context of different activities. So sometimes you're a controller, sometimes you're a process, and sometimes you're even a data subject. But let's get an idea. And, and I, I just want to stress what David said. It's so important to know what role you're playing and who the role players are. So many people skip the step and then try to conclude a DPA with the wrong person. They don't need to have one or they're trying to conclude it with their data subject or with another controller and it's the wrong agreement. So it all starts with what role are you performing? So thanks for your answers there. Let's share those results and most of you are controllers. So most of you are the ones who need to sign the DPA. The law obliges you to enter into the written contract with your processor. And, um, and that's interesting. Thanks very much. So back to you, David. Brilliant. Thanks very much, John. Next, we're heading over to uh, Tracy, who's going to be talking about ranking risks, how to decide who to enter into a DPA with and who not to. Over to you, Tracy. Thanks very much, David. Okay, so as David said, we are here to talk about your risk rating. So um, following on what David and John were saying is it's really important to identify, am I a controller in this instance? And actually, who are my operators? So maybe a little cheat for you that you could um, think about doing is, is saying to yourself, okay, well, let's sit down. I'm generally playing the role of the controller or a responsible party in Papier's instance. And sit down and say, okay, well, who are my suppliers? Make a list of all of those suppliers. And then say to yourselves, 
okay, well, who am I actually sending data to? So are any of these suppliers, are they actually acting as operators? Are they third parties not directly under my direct authority? And am I sending data to any of these people? So now we've, we've got a list and we've narrowed it down from this huge amount of um, suppliers. And we're saying, okay, these are the people who I am sending quite a lot of data to. Then I want you to sit down and say to yourself, okay, we're going to risk rate them. So we're going to say, how high touch is each operator here? So in terms of the data I'm sending them, what's sensitive? You know, um, am I sending them employee data or are they low risk? So um, something that I've also found quite a lot lately, um, especially in dealing with my clients who are actually mainly responsible parties, is that a lot of people are actually quite reluctant to sign DPAs just because it's so new, especially in South Africa. I think a lot of people in the room today are um, from a South African point of view and are dealing with Papia. So as this law is very new in our country, a lot of people are getting these, you know, these contracts dumped on their desks and they, they talk about responsible parties or controllers. I'm an operator. What does that even mean? You know, what type of risk am I taking on board? And um, I think people are getting really scared and they're thinking oh my gosh i'm not even going to sign this contract so um i don't i don't think a good approach is to say is to take is to just let's just dump every single operator of mine with the same agreement let's just you know here these huge 50 page documents let's just give it to every single operator that we have that's definitely the wrong approach to take so that's why we're saying to you rather risk um risk rate them and say how high touch are they on the data so for instance, I know a lot of companies outsource their payroll. So in a payroll instance, you know, your employees are your data subjects and you are the responsible party and you're outsourcing their payroll to an operator. And, you know, there would be a lot of personal information there, um, maybe even some special personal information under Popier. Um, they could be helping you with trade union memberships, um, you know, paying the memberships. Um, so then that would be special personal information. You'd also be dealing with a lot of count, account numbers, which once again, under Popier, um, the, you could be guilty of an offense if you recklessly or negligently um, uh, you know, disclose an account number. So those that would be an operator for me that you know, I would start with them first and I'd go, okay, payroll, um, you know, this operator I'm sending quite a lot of personal information to, so let's start there. Then we have some of our low risk operators. So our low risk operators could be, for instance, somebody who we are social media marketing to. So maybe, um, you know, they run our social media marketing um, they could run our customary, customer inquiries and they've got very low risk data. So they've got maybe our customers' emails, contacts and some names. So that's what they're dealing with there. So then there, you don't wanna go and dump them with this huge data processing agreement. So there I would say, you know, add some DPA like clauses into your existing agreements. And then for your high risk operators, think about doing quite a comprehensive DPA. Um, something that I'm also finding a lot of lately, and it's quite, quite hilarious and, you know, makes me a little bit nervous as a lawyer, is that when I say to people, okay, well, you know, often a DPA is an, an annexure to your principal agreement or your existing agreement. Where's your existing agreement? And they go to me, Sure, Tracy, we don't even have an existing agreement. And, um, you know, when you're a lawyer, I don't like to hear things like that. I, it just absolutely, it scares me. Lawyers, we like to manage risk and we want our risk written down in contracts. So let's not put the cart before the horse. And um, let's also remember that we need our main contracts. So we need to manage all our other important aspects of the relationship, not just our data processing aspects, so we need to have a main agreement in place first, and then we think about either annexing a, a DPA to that or adding DPA-like clauses into that agreement. Over back to you, David. Great, thanks so much, Tracy. Other panelists, any other thoughts on ranking risk? Go uh, Nathan. Yes, and just just to pick up on uh, Tracy's points over there, I think there's there's a lot of confusion out there, or a lot of confusion has been created that you need a separate or standalone DPA for a specific transaction, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, depending on the law, whether it's Papier, GDPR, there are obligations under law that you need to comply with, but those those obligations can be part of your main customer agreement or main supplier agreement that you have in place. 
uh, it's not necessarily appropriate to to have a a standalone agreement in each case and in that way it reduces your the, it may reduce the time that you spend on a negotiation as well as managing risk independently of your customer transaction, if that makes sense. Brilliant. Yeah, totally. Think go for it, John. Great. I, I agree. And, and Tracy, I think you made some great points there. Let's launch a poll as a bit of an exercise here. We're asking, do you process a lot of personal information on behalf of others? And if you can say yes or no, this is anonymous. So, so don't, don't worry. We're not going to pick on you one way or another. Um, but uh, let's have a look, see what uh, what results we get here. And just to jump in there while we're waiting for the answers to come in, um, there's quite a few questions around um, the difference between a DPA, an NDA, uh, and, and an SLA. Um, and I don't know if what, maybe the panelists want to touch in, touch on that at this point. Um, so Kele, I, I definitely am getting to that in, Two points time, so I will get to that. Great, and uh, let's end the poll there and share the results. So more than half of you said that you do process a lot of personal information. So I'm afraid it makes sense why you're on this call because you're gonna get a lot of people asking you to sign DPAs and uh, it, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so back to you, David. Brilliant. Thanks so much, John. Next, we're heading over to Lisa, who's going to chat about how to deploy a data processing agreement, how you should actually go about concluding them. Over to you, Lisa. Thanks very much, David. And deployment really piggybacks a lot off of what Tracy has just said. You've looked at the risk, you've looked at your different um, suppliers, and there you'll really determine the approach you want to take. So there's various different strategies when it comes to deciding the approach you want to take for deployment. Sometimes you might think of a one-to-many model or a one-to-one -one model. So a one-to-many model is um, linked to what Tracy just said. If sometimes uh, controllers might not want to really look at each kind of processor that they have. So for example, some processors might just be supplying you with uh, equipment or even stationary and process very little personal information as opposed to other processors who process um, in that example, the payroll, who process a lot of your personal information and even special personal information. So they might just take a blanket decision and decide we're sending the exact same agreement to all these processors, regardless of size and uh, volume of data that they process. We really don't um, advocate for this approach because you really have to consider in a lot of circumstances who your processes are. So it's better to almost do a one-to-one -one approach. Once you've created that list of processes that you have, you'll look at each one and, and think about, okay, you might be a high touch uh, processor that processes large volumes of our data. You might be a low touch one that doesn't really process a lot of data. Maybe instead of doing a full 50-page uh, document, we're only going to conclude based on what you do with data. So that is a good way to approach this. But we do understand that practically this can be hard for organizations to do, which is why it might be make sense to actually do a test case. Choose a sample of your processors. So let's say, for example, you're only going to deal with initially your processors who only process very little person information. And from there, you might decide, okay, we will sign a very um, basic DPA with them, or we're just going to have um, add additional data protection clauses in our agreement. That might be a way to do it. And just to see how they approach the situation. If you get a lot of pushback because of the clauses that you put in the DPA or how they really deal with it. And that can determine the next steps and the way you will deploy it going for, for it. You can also do the same when it comes to um, maybe high touch uh, processors who really deal with a lot of your personal information because they will be the ones that will likely want to negotiate on a lot more of the provisions and clauses because there might be a lot more responsibility on them um, contractually. So usually doing test cases and a sample might be the best way to deploy it as opposed to just blanket, doing a blanket approach for all of your processors. Another way to think about it is to really decide based on the spectrum of your processors, think about 
um, your old processors or your old existing service providers and your new processors. For every new processor at the beginning or in the contractual stage of the relationship, you should definitely have a DPA in place, but how will you manage your old ones? Um, because the situation with DPAs is that a lot of the times once you enter into another kind of contractual relationship, it might open up the doors for people to renegotiate an existing SLA, for example, or a master services agreement. So that is a risk that you can face when you're dealing with older clients that you've dealt, that you've worked with for a long time. And it might make sense to just really consider how you approach them, whether they're new or old processors, especially if you're the controller. And another thing that you need to consider consider when you are doing deployment is really the method. So in some instances, um, people have automated this. So as I mentioned, they just send the same document out to all of their processors, and they can do that through software such as contract lifecycle management software that can just automate the process for them, keep up, keep up to date and track the DPAs that they've sent, who hasn't signed one, what's pending, and just really also have a repository of all of those agreements. Another way to do it um, is sometimes people will sign, as we mentioned, a document. Other times with big processors who usually have a lot of bargaining power, they will simply have create a DPA and place it on their website, either as a click wrap uh, agreement or just a standard online terms. So it really depends. And I know someone mentioned in the comments about Microsoft, Microsoft and different kinds of big processes do those kinds of things. So that's just something to keep in mind from a deployment aspect. Back to you, David. Brilliant, thanks so much, Lisa. We're taking out our five minutes for that one, but any other points to add from any of the other panelists when it comes to um, the deployment process? No, okay, great, brilliant. Heading back to Tracy, we're gonna chat about the length of data processing agreements and how long they should be, over to you. Thanks very much, David. Okay, so touching on you know what Nathan maybe touched on a little bit earlier is that there are many ways to conclude a data processing agreement. So firstly, like I said, low risk, you could think about putting a clause into your principal agreement. So if you've got an existing agreement with somebody, you could say to them, well, this is very low risk, but we still need to protect ourselves as a responsible party. So let's just pop a few clauses in there. Then you could have a separate data processing addendum that adds clauses to your principal agreement. So this is a very popular approach when it comes to the GDPR, just because of Article 28, there's a lot of writing around, you know, exactly what needs to be in DPAs, the SECs. Um, so DPAs under the GDPR have actually gotten quite lengthy just because, you know, there's come, there's been quite a lot of case law around it. So you'll see if, you know, maybe you are a South African responsible party and you've got some operators in Europe or vice versa, then you might be um, looking to conclude a more global DPA with separate data processing, with a separate data processing addendum that adds clauses to your principal agreement. And then another approach could be a completely standalone DPA that's um, a separate data processing agreement that stands alone. Um, I would say your, your approach would depend mainly on your nature of your relationship that you have with your operator or your processor, um, the structure of your interactions and the complexity of the data processing data processing that is going to take place. So remember, you know, when there's a lot of complex data, um, you know, it's quite high risk then you would definitely look towards a, you know, a more lengthy data processing agreement. And then the nature of your relationship. So this is also quite tricky, you know, when it comes to contract negotiations, you definitely don't want to ruffle any feathers, um, especially if your operator, for instance, you've got a really great deal with them, maybe you've got some great discounts, you don't necessarily want to now open up contract negotiations and say, oh, here's a whole new contract. Um, that's why sometimes maybe an addendum is better um, just so that you don't ruffle any feathers. Um, what I've been seeing a lot lately, um, especially from my clients who are performing the role of operators, is I think people like to jump on bandwagons, especially when it comes to Papier. So if we think about on the first, everybody got a Papier notice, which was not necessarily correct. Everyone just jumped on the bandwagon. And I think people are jumping on another bandwagon now, which is, hey, here's an NDA with DPA clauses in it let's jump on this bandwagon. And um, this is something we definitely do not advocate for. So please don't jump on that bandwagon. 
Um, I think people are definitely confusing um, confidential information with personal information and they're getting their, their wires confused and their terminology mixed up. So think about it as confidential information is something that needs to be kept secret. So for instance, my name, my name is Tracy Boys. That is public information, but it is also personal information. So, you know, John loves a diagram and I wish I had a diagram right now um, with, you know, two circles. They definitely overlap. Confidential information and personal information definitely overlap. But sometimes personal information can also be public and confidential information, you know, like Coca-Cola's trade secret recipe. That's definitely confidential, but might not have any personal information in place there. So let's not confuse our terminology. Our NDAs are for our beginning of our relationship when we're just starting to talk with each other. But when we're starting to, you know, really get more into this relationship with this other business, then maybe we're going to then think about, okay, well, now we need a DPA because we're going to start sharing information. But then we also need maybe better confidentiality clauses and that we can look at putting in the main agreement or in the indemnum. Um, but you're not properly protecting yourself as a responsible party if you're just putting a few DPA clauses at the back of an NDA. Believe me, I have seen this multiple times. Um, and it's very scary because it's coming from massive groups in South Africa that are actually huge responsible parties and they're not properly uh, protecting themselves. So let's think about going with a risk-based approach. So the more risk, the longer your DPA will be speaking to the appropriate security measures in place. So um, high risk information, sensitive uh, personal information or personal data, we need to speak, uh, the DPA needs to speak to proper security measures in place. So do you have those technical organizational measures that the GDPR and POPIA speaks of? And then with our low risk operators, as I said before, a few clauses in the um, principal agreement will do. Thanks very much, David. Great, thanks, Tracy. Thank Any other thoughts from folks on uh, the length from the panelists? Go for it, John. Uh, yeah, just one key point to pick up on uh, that Tracy is talking about is that there is a lot of confusion in a data protection context between a variety of different documents. And it's very important to use the right terms and to appreciate that they, they're four different things. And we've done a lot of work in our data protection program and on our website to explain what the different things are so that, so that we can get some clarity. And, um, and so, yeah, a DPA is very different to an NDA. It's very different to a data protection policy, to a privacy policy, to a PIA manual. They're all distinct and different things. And so it's just really important to use the right terminology so that we, we can all have a discussion. And I think in the context of DPAs, this is really important because if you think of South Africa and the world, there are hundreds of thousands or millions of data processing relationships. <clears throat> we need to sign millions of DPAs. And it's really important because they are multi-party by nature that collectively we have a really good understanding of what they're about. Back to you, David. Totally, thanks very much, John. Uh, heading back to Nathan now, we're gonna have a word on scoping and how to decide what to put in your data processing agreement. Over to you, Nathan. And thank you so much, David. And just to uh, dovetail off of what John had just mentioned, their DPAs are unique agreements, and uh, in in the sense that it's a balance in a, a balance between legal and commercial terms. In the sense that a lot of it deals with your operations as an organization and the measures you actually take to protect personal information. And um, I, I definitely agree with John that. A DPA, what a DPA is not, it's not a privacy policy. A privacy policy is uh, your organization's plan to protect the personal information of, of data subjects. And you usually find it on your website or, or your apps. And it's not a data protection policy. So your data protection policy would be your internal document that you would use to, to set out your strategy for your organization's approach to data protection. In, in simple terms, a DPA or data processing agreement focuses on the controller or responsible parties obligations under law uh, to enter into agreement with the operator or, um, or processor. And, uh, and that's why just bringing back to Tracy's point, 
really the, the, the if, if we go back to first principles dpas and, and data protection in general is about the data subject it's, it's essentially about protecting the interests and, and and rights of the data subjects the data rights and uh that's why uh it TPAs can range in length, as Tracy mentioned, from DP clauses, data protection clauses in, in main customer agreements, so SLAs, well, not so much SLAs, but in the legal terms of customer agreements, uh, to addendums that attach to, to prime contracts or, or standalone agreements. And uh, the point that I want to hit home is that PAPIA and the GDPR specifically have the base obligations that, that you need to put in your DPA, but... Uh, you want to add, sometimes you need to add fluff to protect your, your um, as we say, to protect your commercial risk. So for example, you may want to, as a, as a controller or responsible party, you may want to have audit rights in your agreement. So your audit rights would give you the power to actually investigate whether your operator or process is actually complying with the obligations um, in the DPA. Uh, you can also set out specific uh, technical and organizational measures that they need to have. So basically, uh, very specific measures that they need to have from a security perspective, information security perspective. And then you could also specify whether they may need to have insurance. So if something were to go wrong, that uh, they would be protected from a, a um, so, so that there would be a money pro monetary protection level. And then if you are entering the, the realm of the GDPR, another thing that may need to be, well, that definitely needs to be in your, uh, your DPA is the standard contractual clauses or SECs. Uh, they were new ones released recently. And uh, so, so generally that approach is adopted uh, or it needs to be adopted if you are going to be transacting within the scope of the GDPR. But uh, the, the last point that I actually want to mention was uh, linked to power asymmetries and something that we don't often think about. If you are a responsible party, a big responsible party, um, you are often the person with the most power because there will be little processes um, who actually want to do business with you. And uh, the, you often have the power to set the terms and the processes have to, to, to follow that. But the situation can quickly change where you are a responsible party, but you may be contracting with a very big processor like Amazon, Microsoft, in which case you don't have much scope for negotiation. And I think Lisa will be talking about that more later. But the point is that at the end of the day, you're trying to secure whatever is in your DPA is about securing your interests um, and your rights to check that processes and uh, and and or, or operators actually um, create the environment for you to sh to secure personal data of the data subject. It, it comes back to the data subject at the end of the day, and that should be the guiding point in considering how to scope your DPAs. Thanks, David. Great. Thanks very much, Nathan. Just something to add there. So a lot of the content that goes into a data processing agreement depends on the law you're trying to comply with. So for example, if you just want to comply with PAPIA, technically you only have to have two things in a data processing agreement, that the operator will follow the responsible party's instructions, that they'll implement appropriate and reasonable information security, essentially. But if that's all you put into a DPA, it would arguably be def defective for regulating your relationship because there's so many other things we care about. Now, if you have to comply with the GDPR, Article 28 comes in, and that is a long list of things that need to go into a DPA, including things that Nathan's referred to, like audit rights. Other useful things are things like controlling sub-processes to make sure that I give you personal information to process for me. Someone else can't go and process it on your behalf without my knowledge. It's got a lot of information security tools in terms of if an incident happens, how someone and reports it. But you'll get a lot of pushback from South African processors who don't necessarily want to be held to the high standard of the GDPR. So that's just something to bear in mind. Anything else from the other panelists when it comes to scoping and uh, content of a DPA? Go for it, John. Sorry, I'm mute Sorry, there, John. Let's, <laughs> yeah, let's launch a poll um, relating to this. Um, and this picks up on what Nathan Ross has been saying, and I think Lisa's going to talk a bit more about it, but, but it would be really interesting to get an idea of when you concluding DPAs, are you able to dictate terms? In other words, say to, to the other counterparty, here's the DPA I want to sign, or are you a term taker? Do you do, are you finding that processes or controllers are saying to you, no, look, here's our DPA, sign it or take it or leave it. And I think a great example of a, a term dictator would be um, 
uh, someone like Microsoft or Amazon Web Services, they're not going to entertain your DPA. They've got their DPA and it's really a take it or leave it type of scenario. So uh, I think Lisa will talk about this more, but it's really interesting to see who we've got here. And uh, if we end this, sorry, there was still more of you to vote there, but in the interest of time, um, so most of you are able to dictate terms. So you're able to decide what's going to be in that agreement and, and push it down to others. Back to you, David. Great. Thanks very much, John. Yeah, some interesting insights there um, that everyone's term givers. Um, so I'm just going to chat briefly about uh, liability and indemnity clauses when it comes to data processing agreements. And here we're really just highlighting a common pain point, which is a stumbling block that parties often run into when it comes to concluding DPAs. Now we're all familiar with liability and indemnity clauses. They're in all sorts of commercial contracts and they're really about limiting or allocating risk in any kind of venture. Now, the thing to understand when it comes to data processing agreements is that they are different from normal commercial agreements. And it's against the backdrop of trying to protect the data subject, um, the attitudes that regulators have they don't necessarily want parties passing risk between themselves. In fact, there's a whole debate to the extent to which you can be insured for non-compliance with data protection laws, because ultimately the regulators need to be able to admonish or deal with a business who doesn't protect or respect the rights of data subjects. And if you're insured against it, well, you know, how, how are you effectively um, how are you effectively looking after data subjects in that situation? So if we go to a liability and indemnity clause, um, a common one you'll see in a DPA is just to make it bilateral. I think that's very fair because what a lot of people don't realize is that they think I'm the controller, I'm telling the processor to do things from, for me. The controller wants the processor to be completely liable to them, to have an indemnity for anything going wrong, right? But that ignores the fact that it's a two-way relationship. The controller also has responsibilities. They have to uh, generally find the lawful basis for giving the personal data to the processor to act on their behalf. If anything changes with the personal data, they've often got to update the processor on that. It's not just the processor doing things that way. Um, but, uh, you know, from the process's perspective, they don't want to be held liable for anything that's and, and, you know, clearly this is an untenable situation. And this is what causes a lot of fights when it comes to DPAs, because the law doesn't tell you which way you have to go on liabilities and indemnities. In fact, neither the GDPR nor Papia really speak to this issue at all. So it's up to the parties to decide it for themselves. So maybe the best compromise, if you can't go for a bilateral situation, which is my preference, is you could say that the processor is liable to the controller, but only to the extent that they don't follow the controller's instructions and only when they're in direct violation of their obligations under relevant data protection laws. That's just a snapshot on uh, liability and indemnity. Any other thoughts on that from the other panelists? Go for it, Nathan. Oh yeah, just to check. So, so based on what you're saying, you would you would agree that the, uh, the indemnities actually need to be kept separate or different from the commercial indemnities that that um, parties usually enter into. Yeah, totally, Nathan. And yeah, I, I mean, if we think about commercial indemnities, often they're they're capped at the sort of value of the contract. You know, the amount of money I've paid you as a service provider in the preceding twelve months. That doesn't really make sense from a data protection perspective because you could be exposing me to a lot more risk. Um, you can't you can't think about liability and indemnity in the context of a DPA in exactly the same way as you can in a commercial contract. It's got a lot more things that you need to bear in mind there. Go for it. Yes, yeah, so I think um, a DPA is a contract at the end of the day. And so it's the same principles that apply to any contract apply to a DPA. And the questions are, what is the leverage between the parties? Who has the power in the relationship? And that's often going to, to play a major factor in determining what warranties and indemnities are in place. And I mean, obviously, if I'm the controller and you are my processor, I'm going to want you to warrant that you'll put information security measures in place and indemnify me and, and there be no limits. That's, that's clearly what I want. But it's obviously not what the processor wants. And so you're into a classic contract negotiation and um, the normal principles would apply. Great. Thanks very much, John. Okay, now we're heading back to Lisa to chat about negotiation and how to reduce friction when it comes to concluding data processing agreements. Uh, over to you, Lisa. Thanks, David. So 
Negotiation is something that I think each of the panelists have actually touched on in different aspects, because once again, when it comes to DPAs, all of these issues are interrelated. But I just want to expand on some key aspects related to negotiation. John has just said it. A DPA is, it's still a contractual relationship, so it will be the same normal contractual negotiation process that will take place. Because as we know, in uh, most kinds of uh, contractual negotiations, there are quite common sticking points. As David mentioned, liability, indemnity, what happens when there's a breach? What do we do, do with those different kinds of aspects? Who has the obligations? Do I want to give more obligations based on the laws that apply to me? So those kinds of things are quite common. And once again, you would have to hash this out between the parties. So linked to that is really looking at the approach you're taking to your DPA. Since we really advocate a global approach to your DPA, there might be certain what we call basic or uh, required contractual elements that you would need to put in. So these will be things related to each party's obligations, putting in security measures and liabilities, for example. But it really is about how you're managing this, um, these kinds of things between the parties. Just as David said, you really have to consider the fact that the relationship goes both ways. The responsible party or the uh, controller has obligations and so does the processor, but the lion's share of these obligations are with the um, controller. So it really depends on how you want to deal with it. So for example, if you want to say you're taking a global approach that has quite a few uh, GDPR requirements or GDPR uh, requirements for processors, if I am a processor who's only subject to Papia, I might not agree to certain things. I might just want to say, I only want to deal with the security measures, making sure things are um, putting in place those necessary security measures and making sure that uh, I treat the data confidenti with confidentiality and comply with the conditions of Papia. So that can be a big sticking point. And it's something that we've seen when we've dealt with um, processors and controllers. A lot of the times, and as John said, the processor really doesn't want to agree to anything or be subject to anything, especially if they understand what their requirements are from a data protection perspective. So it is always important to consider whether you want to have a global DPA with a poppy flavor and how that will, um, will affect negotiations. So the next crucial thing is really about the bargaining power. Once again, the, when you're in any kind of contractual negotiation, it is usually imbalanced from a bargaining power perspective. So if you're dealing with big processors, like we said, Microsoft and Amazon, they have, they've already put their DPAs on their website and they have a lot of bargaining power. You as a controller might not have a lot of bargaining power, so you can't really dictate terms to them. It's almost impossible to change the agreement with them. So that is something just to keep in mind where you sit in terms of the scale of who has more leverage and who doesn't. And that will also help you determine um, how you can negotiate going forward. And another key thing to really think about is the role. You really have to understand the role you're playing in the relationship. And that will help you decide if you're able to agree to more stricter terms or if, um, you, you will have to negotiate on those. So as long as you have the minim minimum requirements based on the law that applies to you, that should be fine. But a lot of the times, as I think we mentioned earlier, responsible parties might want to make you agree to contract something that's more than what is required from the law. You have to ask yourself if you're in the processor, if you're the processor, are you able to agree to these stricter requirements? Maybe this is where we have to consider if we have insurance that can cover us if there's a situation. And if you are not able to do that, you also have to think about the fact that maybe they'll just go to a competitor who might be able to agree to those stricter requirements. And then the last thing to consider is the fact that a lot of the times we have our sub-processors. Sub-processors agreement has to mirror the agreement between the controller and the processor. And a lot of the times, sub-processors might not be able to agree to very strict terms. So that can factor into your negotiation when you're dealing with um, the DPAs. Back to you, David. Great. Thanks so much, Lisa. Other panelists, any other thoughts on negotiation? Go for it, John. Yeah, I think um, 
When people think of a DPA, they often think of a traditional agreement. So a, a, a few pages with the parties and some terms and signature clauses. So a traditional agreement. And that is one way of doing a DPA. But you can also do a DPA by building it into your terms, your standard terms that are accepted online as part of somebody registering. So some people call it a click wrap agreement. You can do that. And particularly in a scenario, and, and Saro actually sent me an example of it this morning. You, you can, if you're a business that has a lot of customers, so high volume, low volume relationships, you can't go and negotiate a DPA with every single one of those customers because it's just gonna destroy your, your margin. So in that scenario, you have to figure out a bulk way of doing all of them in one go. And so there's nothing wrong with sending everyone an email and saying to them, we've updated our terms to incorporate what's needed in a DPA into our terms. And by you continuing to use our service, you agree to our new version of our terms DPA solved. And that's really, it's so important for each of you to think strategically and workshop it amongst yourselves about how to tackle DPAs because it's different for different organizations based on, on a number of different factors. And um, another good example here is, is, is how to do it easier. If you do need to do individual contracts with each pe person because your main contract is an individual contract, you might well want to use a contract lifecycle management tool, um, a CLM or um, uh, some form of, of management tool to automate the process. And uh, so you can automatically assemble those addendums and send them out using a tool to have the party sign them electronically and automatically as well. So that's another way of practically trying to reduce the admin burden that uh, exists around them. And I think here quickly, I'd like to launch a, a really quick poll asking whether you, do you currently use a contract lifecycle management system? Um, they were called CMSs or contract management systems, but CLM is really the, the term that has caught on. Um, yeah, so let's quickly get a, a snapshot of, of whether you are using those. Right, I think most have voted. Let's leave it there in the interests of time. So most of you have said no. Um, that's interesting. Very few of you uh, said yes. Um, but some of you said no, but you need one. Um, and I agree. I think it's going to become harder and harder to manage high volumes of contracts without using a CLM and using technology. Great. Thanks very much, John. Um, so we've reached the end of the topics we want to talk about today. I'd like to give all the delegates who've, uh, who, who are on the call a quick, a quick sneak peek of the content of the program. But before we get to that, um, so Kayla, over to you just to ans ask one or two uh, choice questions that we can have the panelists answer. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. I think the first one I'll go to perhaps uh, the stuff that you and Nathan were chatting about in so far as what goes into a DPA. There were a couple of questions on, you know, what is the form? So what must be in a DPA? And I think you touched on that. Um, but there are also questions around, so people are finding that they are um, in the DPAs that they are getting from um, their operators and their, and their responsible parties. There's, there's organizational measures that are required technical measures that are required, um, and they don't know exactly what that means because sometimes they're not defined. So can you just chat a bit more about what that is and maybe touch on the security elements as well? What, yeah, how security features into this um, uh, conversation as well? Great, thanks, Rakeda. And I'll actually do a little demo of the program at the same time. So people are asking about what content needs to go into a data processing agreement. Uh, on the Michelson's program, uh, which if you go to the Michelson's website, you'll see the join program now back in the top right corner. This is the managing data processing relationships module in the program. And here we have detailed content explaining uh, what needs to go into a data processing agreement and where that content comes from. So for example, it really depends, are you looking at this from a Papier perspective or a GDPR perspective? If you click on either of these tabs, it will explain to you everything in detail. So you'll see Papier very limited refers to two sections there. That's the required content. However, when it comes to GDPR, 
you're looking at Article 28, and there's a table here explaining all the things that need to go into a data processing agreement from that perspective. Information security is also another great point, and uh, really all the content we've talked about today in this module, there's an area dealing with pain points. And a very common one is information security, which we didn't touch on today, but you'll see there's a whole uh, little stub here talking about information security. And really, these are the general principles of data protection law. You need to do appropriate and reasonable, what they call TOMS, technical and organizational measures. It's what I like to think of as the science and the art. It's the stuff you can buy, the blinky boxes, the encryption, and it's the stuff you can't. It's training, it's awareness, it's having your policies in place, things you need to put time and effort in. And you typically uh, spell all that out in, in a next to your data processing agreement, which arrives uh, at the end of that document. Any other questions there, Zorkele? Um, maybe the other one, if maybe Lisa and Tracy can jump in here as well, is with respect to cross-border um, transfers and DPA. So um, there are questions coming up around, um, um, are there any cross-border um, um, you know, considerations that you one needs to take into account when they put together a DPA for if they have a, a an operator outside of the country that they that they that they're in, a responsible party is not necessarily in um, the country. Um, any any thoughts there? Um, yes, okay, well, they definitely have to consider cross border, especially as you mentioned, if their processor or controller is in a different uh, country. And especially if that country might not have uh, what we call adequate data protection law. So DPAs really do um, emphasize the aspects of data transfer. And this is something that Nathan even mentioned when he mentioned the standard contractual clauses that most um, GDPR based DPAs have. So these are things that um, you can put into your agreements, which include aspects of data transfer. So you should from that basis really state what will happen when there is a, tr a transfer of data across borders, whether the um, controller or the processor actually would need to put supplementary measures should, there not, should the law that they are dealing with not have adequate protection and explain exactly how that will be dealt with. And you'll see here, David is actually, has actually opened the module in our program dealing with transferring data across borders because DPAs and cross-border transfer are very much linked. Uh, I don't know if Tracy has something to add or back to you, Zarkeli. Brilliant. Um, folks, I think that's pretty much our time for today. So thanks very much for your time and attention. We really appreciate your participation. And if you enjoyed um, today's session, uh, we do a live webinar like this pretty much every Wednesday for the members of the program. If you'd like to find out more about our program, visit michaelsons.com and go top right there join a program and you'll find out more information there. Um, any uh, last uh, thoughts or uh, take home points from any of our panelists? Go for it, John. Just a final thought for, for me, um, DPAs are tricky. Um, there are many flavors of them. The issues are significant. The international developments are changing all the time. There, there are new standard contractual clauses that the EU are suggesting, for example. There are multiple approaches. It depends on your industry, on your organization, on your processing relationships. And so it really is tricky. And um, we built this team um, of people in Michelson's who we're going to be focusing on them. <clears throat> I mean, David um, hasn't had a chance to say much today, which is a pity because David's literally done hundreds of DPAs over the last three or, four or so years, because this requirement has been there under the GDPR. So there, there's a lot to, to build on from a global perspective. It is a new issue to South Africa, but um, it's gonna be a significant issue in South Africa for some times to come. And um, yeah, we keen to help you and work with people and empower them to really help us solve this issue because we as a country, uh, we can't spend hours and hours and hours and hours negotiating and signing DPAs. We need to collectively come up with good solutions to meet the legal requirement and manage our data processing relationships better. That's what we're trying to do. Back to you, David. Brilliant. Last word from Tracy, go for it. Um, and I just want to emphasize to people, please don't jump on bandwagons. So, you know, like I said, with the Popia notices that just flooded our inboxes on the 1st of July, um, with DPA, NDAs, 
Um, if you see everybody doing it, please first consider if it's appropriate, if it makes sense for your organization first, before you jump on the bandwagon, because it doesn't mean that the bandwagon is correct in what they are currently doing. Great, thanks so much, Tracy. And the last thought I'll leave people with is at the end of the day, these are about data processing relationships. And like a relationship in the human sense, um, we need to govern it. And if you think about one of the relationships many of us are in, if you're married to someone, chances are you got married in terms of an antenuptial contract. And that's what a DPA is. So you can get married out of community of property, but if something goes wrong, you would rather have been married in terms of an antenuptial contract. Um, so we look forward to seeing you again online very soon. Thank you for your time and attention. And from me and the rest of the panelists at Michelson's, goodbye.